rolling. How's it going, Future Cannabis Project community? It's that rotten son of a blunt, Lobster Fam Farms, joined again by helpful Harry, Harry Rose. And uh, today I think we have some seasonally relevant conversations, which should be fun. Harry is going to be going over some harvesting and curing techniques that kind of correlates with this time of season. Might be dropping um, some backstories and information on some genetics he has. And uh, you never know where the conversation could sail to with the good Admiral. How you doing today, Harry? Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me, as usual. Looking forward to it. Just heating up a quick dab here to kick things off. Why not? Nice. I think I would disappoint if I didn't anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's that time of year. It's been that time of year. Um, people up here in Humboldt County anyway have started since really August. Some people have some very early strains that they start at the beginning of the season that actually finish up in August. But most people, the, the early stuff, so, you know, quote unquote, would basically start in September and go through the better part of November. Um, so it's kind of a big topic around here right now. We have on and off uh, weather situation here. I don't know how it is elsewhere, but we've had a really incredible year. The weather's been really awesome. It still is awesome, but we are having an occasional splash of rain, which definitely adds a different dynamic. There's a lot of people that, you know, panic chop, we call it. They just freak out and cut because they think they're going to have problems, and maybe they will because they're not really prepared for it. But, uh, you know, over the years, you get to know that um, you can prepare for these things and ride the storm out. If your plant needs to finish, you should let it finish. And more to the point, plan for a mild loss, if anything, uh, rather than not letting your plant fully finish properly. Or, you know, try to protect it, do, do different preventions and so on to minimize loss, obviously. Been a very rough season up here. One of the roughest seasons since Happy belated 420. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> we had a great season. It was just the UV index was too high. In a lot of places like where I am. And so a lot of people learn the hard way that you know, that first run, uh, once the sun and everything really gets to the maximum angle, maximum intensity up here, basically June, July, you really should have some shade cloth, you know. <coughs> and it doesn't have to be much, but the stuff that I grew that way versus the stuff I didn't grow that way, there's no comparison. And uh, when you look at the UV readings, you know why. But that was really the worst of it. We had no no fires. Thank Ja. I didn't even think that till you just said it. This has been a very mellow fire. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I think part of it was the fact we had a rough winter. We had kind of a real winter. But, I mean, the past few years, places like Willow Creek, have taken incredible hits, like almost out of control, you know, just massive, massive burns. We've seen massive burns out by Shasta, Ruth Lake area, um, up by Kenton Palm, very scary stuff, very close to us. And we've had stuff close to us too, like right up on us, but it's been a, a minute like six years or something not that long but yeah fire's a big deal now and it's kind of something everybody thinks about because it's been it got so crazy for so long and we didn't get good winters at all and um it was terrifying you know every year we get just crisp so early and um 
you know, there's a lot of inexperienced people and by inexperienced, I mean, they just don't know. They're just ignorant to how really how scary explosively flammable shit is out here. <laughs> like if we get a couple winners or four or five in a row, like we just did. Um, I mean, it was a little too much with the snow, but in general, it'll bring back enough moisture in the ground that things won't be as scary. It's always a risk when you live in the middle of nowhere in the woods, but these people, they come from out of the area that we call them green rushers and they come in and they don't really know where they are. They're like, well, I'm in the middle of nowhere and they'll smoke cigarettes and just do whatever. And, or even have a burn when it's too late in the year, you know, they'll burn their garbage and set the, or, or they'll burn too early in the year before we've had, you know, a good week of rain. And they'll just set the place up. And I've seen it time and time again. Or people, you, you just have to be out of control careful when it's so dry that just looking at dry grass will make it catch on fire, you know? So we're, we're all kind of shell-shocked out here because pretty much every community out here in the hills has had either a burn through or it's come so close that, you'd have, that you had to evacuate. You know, and um, <laughs> one of the scariest things I've ever gone through was having to uh, evacuate in the Middletown area, and it uh, was it was apocalyptic. Black skies, everyone's full of fear. It's uh, it's something else. It's it's intense, definitely. Yeah, so I don't know. We could be in this other cycle now, this other big swing where we get early, regular winter weather. But us getting three feet of snow out here is not normal at all. And some people got six, eight, ten feet or even more, you know, where they've never had it before, you know, like down in the uh, Men northern Mendocino area in some places where they've never seen. I, we've gotten snow out here, but you usually get a few inches and it melts that afternoon. There are places, there's plenty of places in Humboldt that, says, that sees snow where it stays there. We have above 5,000 foot uh, uh, properties, but, you know, and even above 2,500 feet. But where I am, that's not really the way it is. I have a southwestern exposure and um, at 900 feet. So above me, definitely could get snow. It's just not normal here to get what we got. Um, to get for me to get snowed in for essentially a month is unheard of. To have to get bulldozed out is essentially unheard of. So, anyway, this year um, it was a late start on the year, but it's been a pretty good year. The people that ran a first dep definitely suffered because the bud structure and sizes did not get. Across the board, of course, people did different with different strains and different areas, but across the board from what I saw, you know, it was really difficult with structure and size and potency and so on. Second run, later run, full terms are absolutely stunning. So, because the weather, once it got good, it's been great. So people... uh it was just kind of a weird late start. It's almost like everybody should have just done full term or a slightly later run and called it good, you know. Yeah, hindsight always twenty twenty, and the uh, or after the harvest. <laughs> and and because of that, and and also I, you know, different people are having different experiences. I'm seeing that you know personally, it's taken longer to flip this year. And I've heard that from a number of people that were doing full terms, you know, and didn't debt their stuff to get it initiated. Took a little bit longer, you know, so it happened a little bit later. And uh, that equated to there's a lot of people that are they're like, yeah, man, I think I'm going to have to ride it out into November. And some, you know, there's, there's one person that told me that they're going to end up riding into December, probably a couple of people riding into December because they're growing uh, like real Equatorian style sativas that just take forever anyway. And they took so long to start that 
So we'll see, you know, if we don't have a real freeze up here, then that'll work. If it, if we do get some real hard freezes, then I don't know what's going to happen to that material, but it's worth a shot. If they can land it, it'll be epic. What do you attribute the late uh, trigger and flowering to this year? Because I've heard that a lot too, and I've heard lots of crazy speculation that the planet's off its axis and all sorts of stuff. Do you think it was just the harsh spring? That kind of set everything back, or do you think there's something more complex to it? Well, I know out here we had a very, very, very abnormal winter, and it took a lot longer to warm up than than it has in a long, long time than the than I can remember. You know, like I I don't I can't remember. <laughs> There were there were there was one year when it did stay kind of chilly and rainy into July. Um, you know, and and those are the years that are weird. Like you really need that ground temperature to warm up. You know, but besides that one year, I can't really think of another year. And that year we didn't get a winter like this either. Uh, there was a lot of people that couldn't really properly amend or top or, or a cover crop because there was snow and like right up until it finally melted and it was go time. Like it was so late that when it finally thawed and was ready, like people just felt like they had to go at their first death. <clears throat> um, you know, and, and so they didn't have any time to run a cover crop in a lot of cases that, and, a lot of a lot of people I'm talking about are no till also, so they don't want to really mess around too much, and it just kind of throws everything off. So that could be part of it, but I also think that you know it's partially because of something like the ozone, like the the UV was out of control this year, and it was last year too, but this year it was just very noticeable how the sun, at least here, was too damn strong for any of the plants. You know, even the indigenous stuff was like, uh, you know, and it had plenty of water, but really wild. So I, I just kind of feel like the season got extended because it was getting so much, you know, UV, sunlight, everything that, you know, everything is thrown off, the biology, the the uh, the soil temperature, um, the rhythm of the soil temperature, cooling at night and so on is a little, isn't quite, you know, wasn't quite there yet. It took longer. We had some really hot weather out here this summer. We had a month of triple digits, you know, which is also not really typical. We will get triple digits, but not a month in a row. You know, that is not normal. <clears throat> so there's some, you know, you have sort of these really hundred year cycles, so to speak, right, in the weather. And then you have the fact that every time these weather cycles come around, the earth has changed due to climate change of some kind. And so, you know, it just keeps getting more and more exaggerated as the wheel comes around. That's what I believe. And I'll tell you, you know, I've been talking about these sensors for a long time. The sensors really are very helpful to kind of see these cycles and to know when to plant, when not to plant, and when to start to get nervous. Because if you're, you know, if your pots or your in-ground or your raised beds get to even 60 degrees or below, you're going to start having a plant slow down, but that's also when the, the bugs and mold tend to come in. And even if it's just overnight and it warms up to like 62, 63, you know, that's just barely acceptable. And so you really got to start thinking about warming your, your soil conditions at that point to keep it healthy until you can actually land it. And I highly recommend you mess around with that because um, that's one way to really know where you're at. And regardless of the kind of year it is, you'll be able to gauge things a little bit better that way. You know, it's kind of, it, it's really a cool tool. It's one of the cool tools that I have, 
are the soil temperature and moisture uh, and pH sensors. You sprinkle them around, you could sprinkle them above your root ball, below your root ball, and you can really understand what's going on. If you got moisture below your root ball, but not above, you know, you really don't need to water. You should let it root down more, you know, let it dry back more and then water and get into a better cycle like that and condition the soil. You can also um, do things like I'm talking about and actually start to understand the curve. And after a year, sensors like I have, you have all that data. So you can actually see the curve from day to day, week to week, month to month, and the whole season. So you can kind of see, okay, it's below 60, forget it. You shouldn't be growing. And then you can see it gets to 60. You can see exactly when that hits, how long it's above 60 every day, all day. And then when it finally drops and you can track that again, you know, day to day, all the way to year to year so that you can really start to get a better sense. Um, they don't require Wi-Fi. There's two ways to get it, okay? You can plug it into your internet if you have like a cable modem or if you have a, a hotspot or any number of things. So you, you, you need, the sensors I have have what's called a gateway. So you can plug it into your internet or you can get it with a built-in SIM card cell phone chip. And it's only, you know, it's very cheap per month. But yeah, it, in order to be able to see this worldwide, right, you would actually need to be on the internet. And that's the whole point of this particular system. This is not meant to only be um, on site. This is meant to be able to see anywhere. Um, so you do need internet or you can get the gateway version that has the, um, cellular built into it and just do it monthly that way. And then you can plug an unlimited amount of sensors of all kinds into this particular gateway network. And this gateway, it actually is LoRa. This technology, which is much more powerful than Wi-Fi, you can go for like a mile plus possibly up to two miles line of sight, you know, it's very, it's, it's powerful, it's hardened, it's meant for commercial lag, it's, it's no joke. And it's very accurate, that's what I like, and you can set up notifications and so on. Um, it's very, very helpful. It's been very helpful for me. And I'll tell you that it's not, I, I'm not just using it for soil, I also use it in dry rooms, so I can monitor you know, dry rooms and storage rooms for cannabis. Uh, you can see the temperature, humidity, and you can also get CO2 sensors, right? And then you can hook that up so that it actually uh, will burp your room or turn things on and off to heat, cool, dehumidify, humidify, blah, blah, blah. Um, so that's, you know, that's the other thing that all, it, it can all be in a part of the same system. I also like having the sensors in my freezers for my fresh frozen. So I know what the hell's going on there. Anybody that's messed with enough fresh frozen has had some failures and uh, you know, it's nice to know what the hell's going on so you can recover and not lose anything. So anyway, yeah, that's uh, it's a great thing to actually know, you know, these, these sensors are well worth their money because you can move them around if you only want to buy a few of them. But it really gives you a sense of what you can and should be doing. You know, if you want to grow earlier and the ground's still 50, well, you better heat the ground, you know, or your pots, because otherwise you're going to have you're going to have disease problems almost guaranteed, whether it's fungal or disease or or just setting the plant up to attract bud, bugs like crazy because its immune system is going to be down. Um, so it really is a big advantage for a very, very simple tool. Highly recommend it. Ganja Man, what up? Let me see if I can see the comments here. It's kind of strange on the phone, but if you click around, you'll probably be able to see them. I don't see it. No, I can see it. Cannabis Hills was just in there, too. 
Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. The virtual crew. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if people are really interested. They can just go to Humboldt CC TV. Reach out to info at Humboldt CC TV. That's where I get them from, the whole sensor system. I'm not sure exactly what he's asking there. He's from Portugal, so it might be a little bit of a translation barrier, but I think he's asking what sort of SIM cards. I think they just come with the uh, that model, if you get it, you were saying kind of, right? They Yeah, it's a SIM carded um, gateway that's essentially the brain, that's the ins and outs of uh, this particular system. So you have two choices. Either it's going to be over a cell phone network or it's going to be a part of a regular internet network, whether it's closed Wi-Fi or whatever, but it's a hard plug. It's not a Wi-Fi connection. You're going to plug it in Ethernet. In the case right here, what I'm using, I'm using Starlink, right? So it plugs directly into a switch that's that's part of my closed network that goes to Starlink. Um, if you have Comcast or uh, whatever, you know cable modems or whatever it would plug into your network and it automatically you don't have to do anything you don't have to do this is what's unbelievable this thing is pro gear right so you plug it into your network and it just works it doesn't matter if you if it's fucking passworded or whatever it just works like you don't even have to you don't directly talk and have to set up your gateway with all the IP address or anything like that. When you plug it into a network, it just works. It bypasses everything. It's sick. I like that. <laughs> no, I couldn't believe it either. You just plug it in and it finds everything and it does whatever and it's good. It's so small, the data that it's sending in and out. It's just, you know, literally zeros and ones. You can set these sensors anywhere from real time up to hours when it pings the gateway. And the, the, the reason to do that essentially is to save the battery. Like if you do it every 20 minutes, which is based my default is usually every 20 minutes. Um, it'll last for two to three years, the battery before you have to change it. So that's, you know, but you could do it, you know, every minute, every five minutes, every 30 seconds, whatever you want. But I don't know why you would need it that that much, that quick. Yeah. Moisture, maybe. <laughs> like if you were going to remotely water, I could see wanting, you know, a real time moisture meter. So you could just have a separate moisture meter in your soil that was um you know set to real time i still like that though that's 72 points of data for 24 hours i feel like that's enough to get a nice little trend on you know i like that once every 20 minutes that's still that's a lot of points in general that's i don't see any i don't see a need for anything but i'm sure there's there's certain circumstances where uh small container sizes maybe people growing not in ground or you know i don't know the CO2 sensor is pretty cool because it has a light sensor and a movement sensor. So you can set it to set a notification for CO2, or you can have it trigger something for CO2, but you can also do it for light so you, and have different settings. So like if somebody goes into the storage room and leaves the light on, you know, the cold room, like we have a cold room storage room. If somebody went on in there and left the light on, I would get notified. That's cool. It is cool. You know, and then you, you know, you could have or your left work. freezer door open or something like mission critical, you know, like that's really yeah. cool. Yeah. You can have door sensors. You can have light sensors. Um, we had a guy that got light sensors to put in his depths to make sure that his crew was pulling the tarps off the right time. <laughs> 
that's genius. Because <laughs> <laughs> they <laughs> were a lot of early and early morning and late night calls when <laughs> for that experiment. <laughs> that's right. So you that's why I mean, wake up. It worked. It worked. He whipped them in the chain. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, there's a lot of neat little technology out there for harvest. And there's some neat techniques that really anybody can implore if they're growing from a little closet or tent all the way up to big rooms. This is, you know, or fields full of pot. People are doing this stuff, you know, a little bit more uh, sophisticated now. Like when people are drying now, I've seen many people have. If they grow all year round, they have a second tent, third tent for drying. <clears throat> and in that tent, they'll have a dehum and a air conditioner. And they'll set that up with a controller. And, you know, the other thing that, that a lot of people have learned, you know, if you don't want to get too sophisticated, you can just take all your water leaf off, cut your branches, you know, with your with your buds on it and put it into clean new uh paper boxes like um you know book boxes like the size of they're basically they perfectly fit a clone tray <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah i mean essentially you just fill these paper boxes up and you fold them, you just fold them. You don't even tape them shut. You fold them, you know, one under the next all the way around the usual. You could tape the bottom, but you don't have to. You just do the same thing. And you put it in that room, just kind of crisscross stacked up as best as you can in there and set it for 55, 55, you know, is what I like. Some people like 60, 60. And you just let it ride. And then, you know, next, then the next level thing to do really would be to put that CO2 sensor in there. And um, you, you have a nice hefty exhaust on there that will kick on when the CO2 level gets to 800 PPM, whenever that is, whether it's once an hour, twice, three times an hour at first, and it gets less and less, or even if it's a few times a day, that's what's going to perfectly burp your room. So you have it set between basically, you know, it'll, when it drops down to your set point would be whatever it is outside, which typically is around 400. So you'd set it to shut off at 400 and on at 800 kind of thing. And just let that go with your, uh, you know, your AC and your, um, uh, and your uh, dehumidifier in there. You know, people are doing that now and ending up with really excellent results. Once your CO2 stabilizes to 400, then you're ready to seal it up in a bag. And at that point, if you're not ready to trim it and bag it or jar it or do something else with it, you need to do something to seal it once it stabilizes it at 55 55 essentially and uh 400 ppm you know all around that material it's kind of ready to seal up and then they have these big grove bags that'll hold like 10 pounds you know so you can just put whole branches in there and seal it up and that's one good way to do it or you know bucket down and seal it but you should seal it up at that point for sure I feel like this, uh, overall, this concept has been blowing my mind the last couple of weeks, but I feel like that's an interesting nuance as well, because there was a program on earlier and a gentleman was saying how he pretty much hangs, dries and cures. Essentially, he was hanging his plants for six weeks at somewhere around 60, 60. And he was saying how that was the dry and the cure. And he's like, it's just ready for, you know, that. And I feel like it should be kind of stored a little bit earlier, even if it is in the right environment, just like to get the in a closed container, like you say, whether it be a toe or glass or whatever. Well, and this is what I'm saying, right? If you're in a dry room, if you're in a dry room and you, you know, you can get it to the point, you know, some people don't have the optimal environment, right? So there's one scenario 
where you're going to dry and it's going to get pretty dry, then you need to put it in sort of a secondary containment, not necessarily seal. Let's say you put it into a toad. At that point, you're going to need to burp it, right? So you could put a sensor in the toad, and then when that fills up with CO2, you burp it. Same thing. The burping, whether it's a whole room that's hanging, right? You could do this, the same thing, and this is optimal. This is definitely what I'll be doing this coming year. I can guarantee you that. Um, <clears throat> you have sensors above right above your herb that's hanging and you have a sealed room that's that's has air movement and there's dehumidification in there right and 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 um a way to heat or cool it in my case it'll be also a uh, air conditioner because the dehum kind of gives off some heat so I'll be setting my dehums and my air conditioner so that that gives me that 55 55 is what I like and then the CO2 sensor is going to burp the room. And that's what's really crucial to, to prevent mold, but also to make sure that it cures in a way that doesn't prematurely age the weed, potentially yellow the weed, potentially get, in, get it so it smells and tastes like hay, or you're losing terpenes. It's not as good as you thought it was going to be. You're really going to get it to an optimal place once you get it stabilized to the outside CO2 level, which typically, again, it's it varies a little bit, but let's say it's just around 400. So I always recommend you take a CO2 sensor and put it outside and track it for a day or two, and then you can set your settings accordingly. But what you want to do is, uh, you know, set set your off point to what it is outside or maybe slightly higher, very, very slightly. If it's 380, set it for 400. And then set your cutoff at 800 so it doesn't build up too much. And that's really crucial to prevent oxidation or uh, have mold growth or any number of things. And it's not just CO2. There is moisture that's being let out there. Um, there's other things that are being off-gas there that you want to off-gas and fairly you know, uh, rapid time so that you can then, when it stabilizes at the right temperature and moisture and CO2, again, that's when you can seal it up. And of course, you should always check it from time to time, but theoretically, it should be optimal to put into a jar and store at that point and smoke as well, you know? So that's, that, that's key. And there's lots of ways that you can check your herb there's <clears throat> if you go to cigar connoisseur websites a lot of us were using wood moisture meters you know to just check essentially the 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 the, the moisture level within the herb but what you're getting is an inaccurate relative humidity and so it, the cigar ones have sharper prongs that are longer that are closer together so that you can really stick the bud and it'll be really, you know, embedded inside the bud. So you get a much more accurate reading. And in my personal experience, the best way to do it, I know a lot of people want to smoke it. If they're literally smoking it at about 60%, you know, relative humidity, but in terms of actual plant material moisture level, I like to see it, you know, between right around 10 11 percent moisture and it, there is a difference so most people aren't going to buy the equipment that it takes to check the moisture versus the relative humidity so for long term you're kind of better off storing it drier you just have to be careful you don't want it to be brittle dry but you don't want it to be moist moisture you know moisture is where problems always lie that's where any kind of pathogen mold or whatever is going to take off. <clears throat> so, you know, drier, uh, colder, you know, and then when you're ready to smoke it, then you want to bring that relative humidity up and make sure that it's right around 60% so that it smokes right and it burns right and it's not harsh and it's got the right ash and 
all the crap that the kids want nowadays. <laughs> so here's something which I think is interesting just popped in my <laughs> mind. What do you think of the nuances of different size of storage after the dry for the cure. So let's say on the extreme, you have one of those 10 pound Grove bags that you have essentially a whole plant that you could fit in. If you chopped and you know hung a whole plant, you could probably wiggle one in there if it wasn't too big to where maybe you have branches that are still on the, you know, broken down branches in a tote. And then to the next level, the smallest is where someone's actually bucking down all the flowers from the branches and then storing that for a cure. I know I have opinions from experience, but I'd love to hear what you think if there are any subtle differences from, you know, bucking down all the way to the flower to leaving a whole plant in a grove body bag. I think, um, you know, if you're going to have a long, if you need long term storage of your flower, the best way to do it is the best way that I have found in my own world doing my own methods and so on is to strip the plants completely of water leaf prior to hanging them. Um, I like trying, it, it depends on the situation. If you have a 10 foot plant, this doesn't work, right? So you just got to take big chunks. But I like taking the whole plant and hanging to dry, certainly doing this whole method of getting this, you know, getting it to the right point prior to taking down would be optimal. And then I would put it in a grove bag, you know, or, it, you know, it depends, you know, it depends on how much we're talking about here and what the situation is uh, and what your personal situation is. Anywhere from one of those grove bags loaded up on the stick, water leaf off, sugar leaf on, um, to the right cure so you don't have to burp it anymore, and then seal it up, dark, cool, and, you know, try to leave it in a 55-55 environment. When you're ready to consume it or sell it, you pull it out, you know, do the final trim, and it's going to be beautiful, guaranteed. And I've done that in totes. Um, I've done it in the wax-coated uh, barrels, but I prefer – you know, either a line toad at this point for commercial work, either a line toad or um, one of those big grove bags. Um, plastic doesn't thrill me, but on the other hand, um, I know the job that they do, and they do a really good job. I I use the 454 food grade bags. I also and grove bags are great. You know, especially for small farmers and small production, you can reuse those if you're careful with them for sure. You just clean them out. You know they're uh, they're definitely hardy. Um, they're gusseted, so they're easy to feel fill, and they seal up real good. They burp themselves if that's needed. And um, I've seen some pretty damn good cures. So if you're gonna store something for like up to a year or more, then <laughs> it's kind of what you want to do, and then you want to kind of. You know, and it's also good to make sure you portion things, whether it's personal all the way to commercial, you should portion things. You don't want to have to open that bag. So if you know you're going to open that bag in a year, and let's say you have 10 of those bags, if you know that you need two of them in a year, don't open those, you know, open them up in the order that you're going to use them, only pack the amount that you're going to need for, you know, I don't know, each month at a time at most at most but really the best would be to package it if you're doing it commercially which we do then i would never package more than uh what i would jar with or what i would what i would be using it for i would never pop it open and put it away once it's open it's got to go into a secondary that's going to get really sealed and go into a a, a controlled environment to hold it properly because at that point it's got to be sold. You know, we want it to be sold in a month, but no longer than three months. So in terms of freshness, <clears throat> just to get an idea of, of how we personally do things to try to have it be as fresh as possible for everybody, you know, so you don't want to trim it till the last minute. And, you know, when you do, it really has to get, it really has to already be at the right moisture, right? And the right point of the cure. And that's the whole point, by the way, of studying the CO2. 
again, the CO2 is just one marker that's easy and convenient for us to measure that that's completely relative to all of it. And when it stabilizes, that means that you really shouldn't have any issues with mold or it wicking anymore, like it's at the point where it's ready to consume or put away. And anything past that point, if you don't put it away and seal it up properly, you could start to the degradation process. <clears throat> but if you keep it too moist or you haven't cured it fully, right? If you don't do the burping right and you keep that trapped in there and you hold those gases in there, you're going to start to degrade it. You're going to start to oxidize it. And that's where a lot of people go wrong. This will essentially, it's a, it's a, it's worth it to do because it's, it's sort of a mindless way to get a perfect cure, you know? Yeah, it's that's just, what it's, I like about it. It's been blowing my mind the last couple of weeks since you mentioned it, because the only variables we ever hear are temperature and humidity. We never hear about the content of the air in the room or, or evacuating it that much. You know, I've I've always appreciated sealed dried environments. I don't know why, but it's like I kind of I kind of can appreciate like the uh, the evacuation of a room now, especially oh, if the bourbon shelf life you know like i burped the room organically just by going in there so many times a day to look at it and i but i've never checked it by the meter or actually quantified it it was always just like peeking in okay the temp is good humidity is good give them a little touch and then it's closed back up it was just organic it was never with intention you know good to clear the ceiling though yeah it makes so much sense yeah, no. you know? And they're telling you, well, when they put fresh in air in there. You know, it's very good to put fresh air in there. You don't want stale air. And CO2, to a certain point, for a small amount of exposure, actually helps stabilize THCA and helps it from converting. But too much of it. And, and everything else that's that's going with it in the moisture can make it go the other way, essentially, from what we have experienced. Um, you know, this, it all comes from hippie experience. And, and I, I think that, you know, there's tons and tons of people that have this down. I've seen people have huge scenes where they have, uh, totes and different things and they just open and burp them every single day and they end up with amazing results it's just a lot of work yeah. and so you know we all just kind of need easier ways to get a break but you know this is something that's basically been known for a long time i just don't think that people knew why they were burping it and what was in there and the co2 just gives us a measurable quantifiable way to know whether you're going to burp or not, you know, that's, that's the whole key. Like what kind of measurement can we come up with that will show us when it's ready to burp the room of moisture and gases and so on. And that's just one that is solid across the board that carries through with the whole process of, of drying and curing. And uh, there's a number of people that have done some good work and documented some of these scientific reactions that happen. Um, there's a pretty neat product called the Cure Puck. It is not cheap. It's like five or six hundred bucks, but you can put it on a jar all the way up to a barrel, and it will measure the CO2 and burp it for you. And you could daisy chain them and look at you know a whole room full of these things burping and and doing different things so there's some neat stuff out there there's some people that have done some good work you know i'm not the only one that knows about this by any stretch of the imagination but i'm trying to get people to realize that at least there's ways to to professionally dry and have very consistent results and then know exactly when to put it away a lot of people do great work just by braille, but it's really nice since it's so much work 
to do everything. People have less workers now because the business is so expensive. We can't afford to hire people. We have to do all this metric work and paperwork. We all have to be our own salespeople. So automation just seems like a no brainer as I can afford it. I'm going to automate as much as possible, you know, so that I can actually spend as much time with the plant as possible. And then when things are drying from a commercial side, you better be lining up sales because the flood's going to be on. If you're down, so is everybody else. If you're an outdoor farmer, especially. So you better be working on that, your packaging, your trimmers, if that's what you're going to do, um, your fresh frozen sales, your freezers. Like You should be concentrating on other things other than burping your room or burping all these we used to have all the luxury of having a bunch of workers and having more time to do things, you know, but if it's only one or two people, in my case, it's me. And if I'm lucky, my wife will be here, you know, on weekends or something. Um, so that's why like irrigation, definitely going to be a hundred percent automated coming up here for the season. Um, ventilation. Um, simple stuff you know keeping my tanks full um and then when it comes to drying definitely i mean having that automated is a big deal and for me one of the biggest deals is and a lot of people don't think about this because they just don't think about it is i'm off grid and so i have to do everything as low power as possible and <clears throat> and as economical as possible so I don't want to, you know, elongate my dry any more than necessary. And I want to be as efficient with my power as possible. So I don't want to run, you know, any type of equipment until it's necessary and have that toggled on and off based on what it needs to be versus just clicking on and off for the, you know, the way, the way we've always done it, just set it right on the machine, essentially. Look at all you guys up here. <laughs> yeah, 120 folks watching. I got a couple questions queued up if you wanted to uh, check them out. I yeah. feel like that's an interesting nuance as well about the rush to market this time of year where it's like I feel like there's, you know, the, the, the dry it as quick as you can, get it trimmed as quick as you can and presentable and get it to market first approach. Or I feel like there's the the tortoise approach, which I like, is if you dry it and cure it correctly and store it correctly, it's going to move eventually. You know it. You can guarantee it as long as it stays quality. Whereas that race to get to market first, if you rush the processes and don't get there, then you're just sitting on a problem until next harvest. So I feel like nobody can like afford to wait, my friend. Nobody can afford to wait. Okay. That's the whole thing. You know, like you've gone all year. You need that. You need that cash infusion. The second you, you really need the cash infusion to go into harvest. So you, you know, it's such a squeak for all small farmers. I can tell you, I mean, I've, I watch it with all the farmers I work with now. I've done it myself. So this is where light depth came in strong i know there was a green rush and it became a thing so i'm not ignoring that but it really around here from from my memory the way it really started was people had a small depth people started making small depths that were full full-term growers full-term sun growers they started doing small depths so that they could come down and make some money and be able to go into the harvest of their big crop their big outdoor crop and be able to afford the trimmers and the buckers <clears throat> and, and the people that help them get it down. And so, you know, it's a problem, you know, it's a problem and people haven't really figured out the right timing and the right business models to be able to handle it. If you're small, the way it's structured with the intense compliance along with the expenses, it creates a situation where, you know, you really need that money right away because you just barely made it to, to the next harvest if you're just a full-term harvester in most cases. Um, because by the end of the year, in most cases, people don't even want your herb. Unless you tell them it's a mixed light, in most cases, people...
you don't even want full term. So it's hard enough, you know, as it is. And so <clears throat> people get excited for fresh herb and, you know, you got to serve it up. And then you're right. I mean, there's no question that properly cured and uh, cured herb trims better. And of course, be, if you trim it at the right time, it's going to smoke better too. I think everybody can agree with that one by now. I think, um, you know, it has to be at the right part of the cure. It kind of can make it harsher in the end to actually combust type of smoke. Um, I don't know. You know, I, it, it, I've been trimming on demand for the last year and a half or so, just because, like you say, the teams are so small now. It's essentially me. If I get an order on Monday for Wednesday, I'm waking up early Tuesday and just getting it done. And I feel like that gives a real good quality going out. It's pretty much the best example that day as it leaves to where it's going you now. Yeah. And, and just not and, a workflow necessity. I feel like it's not a you know a masterminded plan. It's just like workflow necessity is dictating that it's like a good trim on demand, essentially. They changed the the laws and and building department code requirements. So now, if you're less than ten thousand square feet, you know whether that's in or out, um, you can uh, trim. You're at your at your place because yes. otherwise you would have to get another processing license, yeah. which you know it all just keeps stacking up. And so that's kind of a big deal that just finally came through. But then there's yeah, still places. There's still places like Sonoma. I think you still have to have a specific uh, trimming, you know, processing license that has to be attached to a cultivation license. Yeah. And it has to be in a CDPH, you know, compliant. They don't make it easy. I wouldn't um, be able to sleep at night if I knew it was all off site with someone that didn't really care and just waiting. I would be a nervous wreck. <laughs> well, there's that. But even if it's on site, it would still have to be you'd, you'd have to have a CDPH compliant building. Essentially, if you were 10,000 square feet or bigger. You know, you could have a building right next to your grow and do it on site, but but everything has to be compliant, you know, with cleanable surfaces, proper ventilation, and of course, legal labor is a big deal. <laughs> um, and, and by legal, I mean on the books mostly, whether, you know, however that happens. Um, anyway, it, uh, and that's most states, you know, when you're kind of in a transitional period and, and sort of a medical thing, it's it's a, it's definitely different. You know, the, the best part about medical for sure. And you're enjoying that now. And that's one of the things that you're going to miss the most is being able to rapid fire your shit. Right. You can't do that once you're locked down to um, essentially as a you would have to have a distribution license or some kind of processing license to do what you're doing, which could happen. Um, but you know, it just becomes more complicated. You have to batch test everything, right? You can't just write, like we used to just be able to knock out a bunch of tinctures and psh, send it down the road immediately. Now it's got to get batch tested and restickered and, you know, things like that. And, and of course, that means that you don't want to just do it for a for you don't want to just batch test four eighths or even th you know if you have to i guess but you know what i mean like if all you're going to ship out is a dozen eighths that week do you want to fucking pay five hundred dollars for a batch test so you know that would be crazy and it would impact you i could barely afford the lab test that like i really 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 want or need to do so it's like to just do extraneous ones like that it's like it's yeah that'd be game over you know i'd be monocropping or like something would change you know well that's what i'm saying like once that becomes a thing and it will once it you know once it changes the the, the dynamic from just sort of being a a um you know, more of a, a right and a jury statement to, you know, completely regulated adult use laws. Um, 
the dynamic will it changes in that most people that cultivate sell bulk and it took a while we had to demand and fight and we'll see what happens to get rid of a cultivation tax which in the end ended up being basically 160 bucks a pound for flour which is a right. lot that's about so how got, much the units were going for summer 18 19 and stuff is crazy it was well yeah and so we got you know so that's gone but now you know now you've got 500 bucks a batch for testing and in certain cases it does fall on the farmer but testing for potency has come way down and you kind of have to have a relationship with your farmers or they have to have such big batches that they're okay with testing it themselves because essentially you've got to know that it's over 20 percent. if it's not over 20 percent, it's got to be something real special that you know you're going to be able to sell selling it's coin. fucked up it's fucked up but it's the truth and so that's part of the problem and so usually a lot of farmers will do a potency test which is like 50 60 bucks which sucks but it's not the end of the world <laughs> depending on the size of your batch of course salud <laughs> excuse me that's Here's definitely an issue depending on the size of your batch but then, you know, the COA test, if it fails, then it does kick back to the farmer. If it fails for microbiological, chemical, um, you know, stuff like that, though, and, and heavy metal, those three are, you know, then you're, you send it to your distro and they test it, right? And then essentially that's the Russian roulette because it could end up costing you 500 bucks to be there, or you can end up, have them use the test sell that bulk batch take it off the top and you actually get paid and that's kind of what the bulk market has turned into you know you really need it's not to say you can't sell it small small batch and and there are people that have their own deals and their own relationships but most of the time it's got to be 10 to 20 pounds minimum per batch per flavor you know, you can do up to a 50 pound batch per COA test. And, um, you know, that's kind of what cultivating turns into. It takes a lot, as I think a lot of people know, to turn your cultivation into a brand. And <clears throat> that's a whole bunch of time and money that you got to have. And it's hard enough for a lot of small farmers, so they're not able to do it. So. That's why I always tell people, you know, my recommendation is just stay focused and grow the most amazing, amazing flower you possibly can. Grow it organically, you know, grow it the best the way you can. Jadam nutrients are free. Once you get there, you can, you know, really dial everything in so you're not paying anything for soil or inputs. You can make your own compost and gather your own cover crop seeds, the whole nine yards to really make all of that free so you can just focus on any propagation needs and taking care of the plants versus dealing with any of that stuff and having to purchase that stuff as well as just honing in on your craft and make sure you really clean your plants up don't waste any time or energy or plant food or space on growing garbage you know the the the, the trim industry the biomass industry you need so much to be able to sell people that it's not really worth it unless you have a big scene. If you have a big scene, that's a different story. And I'm talking like a half acre because people nowadays want like, they have like thousand pound minimums, you know? <clears throat> and trust me, it's a pain in the ass to gather that much. And even as a farmer, my size, it's like I'd get a couple hundred pounds and then it was like I'd have to wait and couple it with somebody else's and then it got homogenized. So if they didn't have as good a test results as I did, mine would get watered down and you know, it's just a, it's not worth it. So that's why shave your bottoms and centers, only focus and grow what you're going to sell. Don't grow, don't grow shit. You're going to mulch unless you want to mulch. Um, I love that comment. Don't grow shit you're going to mulch unless you want mulch. Like, <laughs> well, it's true. <laughs> yeah. I'm not selling larf. I'm not selling Straight little up. tiny weed. I'm not selling leaf. 
And <clears throat> I try to, I try to get rid of it strategically a lot more leaf than most people, because I have seen test results go up from that, which I am interested in, whether it's from a jarred flower sales, uh, you know, need all the way to extraction. Like why wouldn't I want the highest amount of cannabinoids per square foot? <clears throat> I mostly look at a crop in terms of extraction or making hash. Um, it's been a long time since I've focused just on jarred flour, but regardless, having higher test results, honestly, you know, not dishonestly, is definitely advantageous because that's unfortunately how the market is directed. And you also want to have the highest cannabinoid content you can anyway, the fullest spectrum and so on. I've heard that um, the acid that there's an acid that the plant makes when it's kind of separating the fan leaf. Mm -hmm. You know, when the fan leaf is getting brown and you can just barely touch it, it'll fall off. I've heard yeah. that's an acid that the plant's creating to do that, and that increases cannabinoid production. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of anything like that, but when I hear you saying how stripping the leaves a little more aggressive, I'm wondering if that's somehow eliciting that same acid to be produced, like artificial, like, you know what I mean? I think that could be maybe a little bit of it, but what specifically mostly it is, is getting more sunlight in there because the sunlight, you know, if, if the environment is correct and you're getting a better exposure to the sun, the sun is going to make it, you know, better period all the way around. You get a better immune system and you will get higher cannabinoids, the higher, you know, as long as you get even sun, that's the thing. Some of the stuff on the inside could potentially not have as high, of a ter of a uh, terpene or cannabinoid content is the top because of that whereas you could even that out a lot better which gives you a much better average especially for extraction <clears throat> here was one of the early questions i know you typically have some insight on terpenes and uh, he's talking about farnesine here i'm not sure if you're familiar at all but he seems to be correlating it to rotting fruit Well, just realize this, okay? You're right. You're very right. You're on to something. That particular terpene, along with sometimes uh, myrcene, along with sometimes linalool, it really depends. But what you got to think about with terpenes is, or anything that, that we currently are doing in the cannabis industry, this is... This always kind of pisses me off when I think about it, but it is the God's honest truth. We're only measuring certain things. So they're good markers, but the way you have to look at it is that particular terpene that you're identifying has the tendency to have certain spectrums of other things that smell like rotten fruit, specifically, usually, the flavonoids and other, you know, secondary metabolites that we are not currently identifying through testing. So, you know, when you see certain configurations of terpenes, not always, but when you see certain configurations and certain things present, there are certain leanings, you know, sometimes this configuration tends to lean towards strawberry or, or, pineapple or blueberry or pine or you know these different things but a lot of what we like and a lot of the more mouth staining and mouth heavier mouth feel type of terpene spectrums as we know them are because of other things that are in there like the flavonoids so just always keep that in mind you're definitely onto something though i mean that is one of the tendencies to see that terpene and that you know kind of stinky rotten papaya or mango or you know but <clears throat> it's the other things and i wish you can't spend all you know it would cost a thousand two thousand dollars to test something to get it done the way we we want and for, even flavonoid, with for flavonoids specifically i was just curious i've never seen a cannabis flavonoid test before i don't think there are some people that have that are doing it, but people don't do it as a rule. 
and even terpenes, you know, even a great shop, they're doing 30, 40. And we know that, uh, you know, uh, I've read in many places, there's like 380 terpenes in a strawberry. And that is nothing, that's not even counting the flavonoids. So we're missing a lot of the picture. And I think I said this on the other session that we had here, that some terpenes are very, very powerful to the point where you need a lot less of that in the mix to have just as much or more potency as something that could potentially be 1%. You could have something at 0.01% and have it be completely overpowering the thing that is 1% or be equally as powerful as that thing that's at 1%. You know, these terpenes are not, it, you know, they're not all created equal based on percentage of that specific terpene in the mix. I hope that makes sense. But that's also oh, something. That how some could be like way more catalyzing, mm -hmm. like that point one could be more potent than a full percent for what it is. It's just a super catalyzing maybe for that person's EDC or. Yeah, and that's, that's really, really, really important to, to keep in mind because we always look, oh, this is beta caryophylline dominant. Well, that's cool because beta caryophylline acts like a, like a cannabinoid and it actually will latch on to the CB1 receptor just like a cannabinoid. And it'll bring the other terpenes and cannabinoids with it. But it does not mean that it is the leading effect of the spectrum of that series of chemicals that you have extracted and then intake as a human being um it's pretty interesting yeah that's super cool we 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 you know we the way that i have figured a lot of things out are are trends you know that you can see but there's so much that we're not testing for that will as we start testing and as people that are smarter than me and have fancier equipment than me start using our base information and narrowing it down and really looking at the more granular, just keep, you know, t tuning in the microscope in on these things to, to really see the variations, you know, then we can really get better and better and better with our selections for medical purposes, adult use purposes. There's a lot of people that like certain effects but don't like others. And then there's people that like the opposite of that directly. You know, I know I like pe I know people that like very anxious, high, strong type of cannabis. And I know people that have been scared of cannabis because they've gotten anxious and have never found something that works for them, but I know that there's something out there, but they were scared off because of that experience. So this type of thing will really, you know, kind of make it so that people can have really customized experience, customized experiences. Speaking of anxiety, here's one from, uh, from big John. He's asking which cannabis would you recommend to, uh, to alleviate anxiety? If you had any suggestions, um, I know it's a broad question, but you really want to make sure that you stay away from certain strains until you're you're sure of. There are certain reasons why people are anxious, you know, and there's a wide variety of reasons. So, you know, to just generalize is a little bit dangerous, but. Um, when it comes to things that you should be careful of in terms of terpenes, that's known. Um, you want to be careful of things like the terpenaline spectrums. If it has terpenaline, osamine, um, and, and limonene, those, it's a really stimulating type of um, uh, combination for a lot of people, but not always. But in most cases, those tend to be, you should be careful of those uh, terpenes just in general. Um, people that, you know, are very anxious for fairly typical reasons, 
do very well with combinations of either myrcene dominant or beta caryophylline with myrcene just under that with a touch of linalool in there that gives you more of a calming sedative for a lot of people type of reaction so uh, you also have to be very aware of your of your situation if, if cannabis makes you anxious and you are an anxious person then you really want to make sure that you you get some tested material so you actually know these things right you want to make sure that you know that you're actually smoking something with those terpenes in it but the other thing is to have something that's with those terpenes it's more like a one-to-one -one or even a three-to-one um would probably be great for you if you have extreme anxiety i would recommend smoking something that is more like a 20 to 1 right around you know it could, it could be 18 it could be 23 but i wouldn't go too far in either direction and that'll be very calming you could do that in between or with thc you can mix it with thc i'd mix it right in yeah but essentially, you got to be very careful of your terpenes because, again, those particular terpenes are going to carry other compounds that you may not see the test results for that are very stimulating and can make people overly anxious or their brain overactive. You know, some people it can have very, st I've had this plenty of times where you actually can shake, you know, your neurosystem gets electrified. <laughs> So, you know, a lot of what people call, you know, these, these terms, indica and sativa are bogus, but what people would call if it was real, you know, an indica is more to your type and, and, and you should stay away from things that are higher in the, the thin leaf drug plan or sativa and stay towards things that, you know, and honestly, a lot of those things are low THC. A flower like old school purple kush, granddaddy purple, is a low THC. It's exactly what I just described. It's the perfect spectrum, very calming. It's also very medicinal. So those, you know, those older strains that are what people call an indica or a broadleaf drug plant, that's really, you know, what you're looking for to stay away from the anxiousness. I hate those terms, but you see them in the market all the time. So when you go shopping, it's unavoidable. Yeah. <clears throat> I feel like that's a three prong conversation. There's consumer to seller, there's grower to grower, and then breeder to grower, or let's say seed seller to potential customer that way. And I feel like the conversation with Sativa Indica is always so dynamic depending on what context it's in. But I feel like even though it's the most bogus, it's kind of the most valuable for the consumer at the end of the road. So it's like, even though it's totally bogus, they need some frame of reference. They're probably not on here watching, nerding out as much as I do or asking as many questions. So at least it gives them like some place to base something. I know it's all wrong, but. Well, the other thing is, and somebody just brought this up, <clears throat> you know, Longer cured, older weed tends to be easier for most people that are anxious. It's it's just better cured. It's evened out. Anything that would make somebody anxious tends to be kind of mellowed out. And it really, hopefully it was stored properly. Having just a touch of naturally occurring, literally just a touch, just a, just a blip, just even 0.1%. You don't really want too much of cbn in there could be good for somebody if they have really high anxiety but you don't want extra added cbn because it can be dangerous how they synthesize it is not safe and you don't want to take large amounts of a denatured basically converted molecule because your body just does not know what to to do with it or how to handle it properly and you know we don't really know what the long-term effects of that will be. That's cool. Casa's tuning in from Portugal. I've never seen his name in the chat before. It's pretty cool. Slow cured, but also long, you know, like it really needs to get past a certain point 
for it to be smoother all the way around from the actual smoke all the way to the effects most people like you were saying lobster it's just the reality people have to rush it to market just to make some money before the winter sets in because then the flood hits and this is you know the largest market unfortunately in the country right so the flood kicks in it's harder to sell anything over the winter of course there's an exception to every rule there's plenty of people that have great accounts but in general you know as a small farmer especially you want to kick something out so that you can live over the winter time and not starve and then um you know things start rolling in after a while and and it gets a little bit more scarce towards because those those known everybody's searching for fresh weed at first so they'll buy it from anybody even if it's not their normal purchasing pattern people right so then as soon as they get that first load in, then they go with their normal people and that kind of slows it down for that peripheral group. Once that, once those people are depleted of their supply, it goes back to the peripheral group starting in the spring, summer, fall, and then we got harvest again. <laughs> it's really a hustle at this point. The bottom line is always, so many really strategies to too. You could harvest a little premature. You could dry a little quick. You know, like you can move the uh, the product a little bit east. It'll dry from dry super fast. Like, well, like that's kind of the you know in in the legit market out here. That people that are in the know, you will maybe even have a different crop that that finishes earlier. Like just a small thing. You got to get it up, get it trimmed, get it to market. And then you have hopefully the luxury to, to land the other stuff properly and let it take the time to really cure out nice. You know, whether you have a fancy setup or whether you're burping it by yourself or paper bags like I used to do, I'd have 10,000 paper bags. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I'd go to Safeway. Can I have 10,000 paper bags? Yes, there'd be five cents a piece. <laughs> that's fucking crazy um anyway those you know everybody's got their own style and 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 their own situation I, that's partially what i love about cannabis everybody's got their own rituals how they grow how they smoke how they look at everything but with those you know parameters that i just laid out there i'm hoping that people can come up with their own kind of version because again you can burp a clock, you could burp a jar, a tote, a barrel. You could hook it up to an exhaust and burp a closet, an armoire. You could do a, these tents, the grow tents are real easy to deal with. And they have those anywhere from like a two by two all the way to something that'll fit your garage, like slip fit, you know, so you can have your ventilation, have charcoal or not. Like there's a million different ways to do it. But those are the basic parameters. And, you know, the most important thing is that you do have a sealed environment and you're able to embed your sensors in a way that you can capture the CO2 levels emitting. So you sort of have this accurate snapshot and a way to burp that, you know, jar, tote, room, dry tent, whatever it is. By the way, we're going in on some tea basil. Nice. Which one was that? I didn't catch the uh, the genetic on that one. I don't even know what the hell this is. This is <laughs> he's got a batter and a jam in here, and he gave it to me. And they're all labeled on the bottom normally, but he didn't label it, so I, I honestly don't know. I'm sure it's top notch either way. It's gonna. I mean, it's good. I, I honestly don't know what the hell it is. Though it's kind of weird. Send it. So. Shout out to T. Beasel. That was cool. He came down, harvested some figs, made some cool stuff out of it. I haven't seen the final product yet. He just got it to the point where he could put it away, I think. But he's going to make some super high-end um, preserve out of it, I believe. Super heady. We just harvested a bunch and made a, a fig um, sort of... Uh, strudel out of it which we've never done before we've had that 
tree for like 20 years, you know? That sounds good. Little this maple. year, we, we cleaned and froze and then vacuum sealed, right, when they were hard as a rock. <laughs> we did that with a whole bunch of them so we can make some different preserves and pies and shit later. We just don't have the time. That's awesome. So I deep freeze them at negative 30, and then you put them, you lay them flat, right, in a vacuum bag, and whoosh, <coughs> and it comes out beautiful. So I guess, I guess one, other, one other thing I know um, probably won't go too, too long in the show. I definitely wanted to hear about uh, any... Um, genetics that you might have that you would want to talk about I think some stuff's finally going to hit daga and uh i'm super curious what's going to be up for grabs i'm still kind of making up my mind about daga i did speak to peter just actually right before jumping on here oh wow cool <laughs> and so i'm gonna figure out what line or lines to put up and it will be different than there won't be the same material that's up uh, currently on Humboldt Legacy Seeds. It will be Jim's Beans, just like on Humboldt Legacy Seeds, but it won't be um, the same strings. And so it's kind of TBD. And I think that I can always add to it. You know, I'm looking at some stuff potentially from Malawi. We have some Uzbekistan. Um, we do have some other Durban crosses that are pretty interesting that have nothing to do with the sherbet or the um, Long Valley black lime that are currently offerings on the Humboldt Legacy Seed site. And, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so, you know, I have some pineapple offerings. Um, I'm really just trying to figure out what would be best and how much to. How much to release at once and what to release but i'm also considering some hindu because i have um sort of a whole different line of hindu crosses from two different or three different villages that you know i used to work with a lot of hindu kushes that i got from amsterdam in the mid 80s and i really like hindu from back then and I would like to get back to it and do more selections, but it'd be great to get it out there and have other people do some great selections. So there's all kinds of Hindu crosses, including um, I believe I have a garlic rose Hindu cross that maybe that would be interesting to let out. Um, so I think that's a cool pick for, uh, for winter seed poppers. It'll be mostly indoor cats in the Northern hemisphere. And I feel like, yeah, Hindu is a good, uh, a good winter adventure. I like yeah. That. Great. So if anybody wants things now, we're doing a three for one fifty on humble legacy seeds, but then, you know, there's going to be some fresh, interesting offerings on Daga, which I'm super excited about. I think I caught you say there's uh you're doing like a promotion almost like a raffle for if people get like the uh the three pack deal or something. I was real busy this morning when you were doing your live, but I thought I caught something super interesting like that. We're trying to figure out a, we have a really cool mini glass rig. That's really nice that obviously it will show people. But we're trying to figure it out. You know, whether it's the first person to buy, you know, two, three packs or whether it's, you know, some, you know, pulling uh, drawn straws out of a hat, you know, for the first five people to get a three pack. We're trying to figure it out. You know, we have to write up the rules and be legit about it, um, depending on what we're doing, of course. Could just say the first person to get a six pack and then we're done. Um, but nonetheless, it will be for, um, a glassy, a nice little glassy That's care cool. of Sandy selections. Sandy selections is donating that it's a really nice one. The other thing is for every three pack, we're actually throwing in, um, dealer's choice dealer being me. I'm going to 
throw in something that is not being offered currently, and I'll definitely pick something super heady for that, and that will get thrown in for each three pack. So if you bought six and won the bong, you would also get two additional packs of dealer's choice. And if, yes, we would have two different ones. We wouldn't make it the same. <laughs> Just to cut those questions off immediately. Yeah, the shoes yeah, the shoes coos are coming along. I'll probably get some cuttings for backups, maybe two weeks or so. And uh yeah, stoked to see what they do. I can't wait to see what they do too. We're gonna be doing a lot of, you know, it, it this is just gonna be a short lived thing, so you know, pretty much just a few days here. Uh we should have this little sale and we will announce, you know, the giveaway essentially. The bong giveaway, we'll figure that out as a part of all this. But this the sale is is ongoing, but the giveaway will be short lived. Super cool. Yeah, fuck autos. <laughs> <laughs> I love CBD strains though, but you know it's got to be a Lawrence Ringo strain pretty much for me to, bang, to grow up. Fuck autos. He said, bang, bang. Got him. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've still never grown an, grown an auto, so I can't say it with such a uh, resounding. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, you know. I had such high hopes, especially with the autos, the sources of the autos that I got. I really had high hopes. And then I tried some other ones that were bred for fast finish. Yeah. And in both cases, just not what I wanted, you know. I guess it depends on why you're growing, but for me, it just it it just fell short. So, not into it. Is that one of your genetics, Harry? I never seen that. Blocksburg. Blocksburg OG. Oh, nice. Yeah, I sent that out to a few people and. Uh, the other thing is, you know, we are stuffing the vials. I always say 12, but there's been like 30 in a pack typically. I don't know what you found. How many did you find? <laughs> they were stuffed, like you say. I still haven't even got through the first one. But if I had a guess, I'd say 40, probably closer to 50 per, you know. They were they were loaded. <laughs> Appreciate it. Yeah. I haven't been skimpy with the seeds. I want to make sure that people get a good crack. They can get, you know, get something out of it so that, you know, you know that out of that pack, you're going to find something that's going to be good. And you may find a bunch, but at least, you know, even if you have not optimal conditions or whatever, you should be able to get a good crack. That's my goal. There's no point in people getting it if they're not going to have success in my book. Yeah, I'm stoked too because that's enough to share a couple or that's even a couple hunts. You know, you pop 20 seeds here, 30 there. You can gift a couple away if someone's interested. That's it's very cool mm -hmm. to have that many instead of just six or ten. That's a whole different. So These are from big seed crops. You know, these drops for me are from big. Like I, anything that I only have a small batch of, I'm, I'll just grow and re-up. Like I'm not going to, you know, I have anything that I – um letting out you know i have <laughs> on store i can pick out really good ones and that i have enough behind it so that it's actually worth something um but it is a finite amount and that's it <laughs> the other thing is i'm only making a certain amount of these packs per drop i just haven't finished this yet you know um I made like a hundred packs of each. And so that's it. Very cool. That is it. But I still haven't gone through a hundred of each. So truth be told. Yep. I'm going to try to swoop some up to run through and to uh, tuck away for a rainy day or a sunny day. Why would we say tuck away for a rainy day with seeds? Tuck away for a sunny day, I suppose. <laughs> I'm super stoked to see like people go through the pineapple. There's a few people that got the pineapple. There's a few people that got the OG. Um, somebody got the um, Great Babe Cross, uh, which was awesome. A bunch of people got Shush Koosh. 
So yeah, I'm past, still growing the pineapple. I actually have a buddy here that's um, that has been on tons of farms growing pineapple in Mendo and Humble. And I was so stoked when he got up here, I got to show him my pineapple piff and the pineapple leaner fino I showed him, he's just like, authentico. <laughs> so it was awesome to have the affirmation of someone who's been around it way more than me. He's way more familiar with the pineapple than me. And uh, so cool. I'm a big fan of that one. There's two different real directions, but they both are sugar sweet, the real ones. There's the Afghani lines, and then there's the, the Thailand lines. And the Thailand lines tend to be on, like literally sugary sweet. Like literally, if you eat it, it will taste sweet. It doesn't taste like a perfect pineapple, but it does taste like fruit. It's really interesting. Yeah. Whereas the Afghani is not like that, but it definitely totally smells like dank pineapple. I, I was just and, asking him, he said mostly it was the pineapple tie they were calling it on the farms he was working on. Yeah. And I, uh, you know, I don't know which one's my prayer. The pineapple tie is not as powerful. It's not as potent and it doesn't have quite as good a yield, you know? So people cross the Afghani with a couple of things to make it yield really high. Like we grew this one called the pineapple euphoria. Um, that was made by this guy on this hill actually. And it's incredible. Um, and that's the Afghani leaning one. Uh, this one right here. This is the this is the old uh, seed bank from Ringo himself, pineapple euphoria. But then, did that have purple diesel in the genetics? The purple cheesel. The purple cheesel was purple diesel skunk number one times cheese times purple Urkel cheese. Wow. So that one was that, sick. And that, that was one of my favorite ones. That was one of the most medicinal plants for me. That was that just made me think clear and operate and functional. I mean, I miss that plant. I love that plant. That's cool. It's sick, though, if you think about it. Purple diesel times skunk, number one, times cheese. With cheese, yeah. And that is crossed with purple urkel times cheese. And he had a really good purple. Anyway, this pineapple euphoria is the Afghani, and that was just high THC rock and just mouth staining pineapple. And then his pineapple Sioux was sour tsunami times pineapple tie weed. And that was totally different. This was like a tall, lanky, airy plant, but most incredible smell, most incredible taste, most incredible medicinal effects. And I use that as my three to one or number three forever in all my formulations. And I actually have the last of what Ringo had in his collection when he passed it. <clears throat> I was fortunate enough that one of the sons gave to me. So I'm going to crack that at some point and re up those seeds because they're incredible. It's not a high cannabinoid content. It's always like 14 to 17% max total cannabinoids. But it's the most incredible spectrum. The smell and taste will, are just dynamite. I just love it. Um, it's it's really electrifying stuff. And it's not like I didn't like the pineapple euphoria in the Afghani. It's just that's very heavy. Whereas the pineapple, this pineapple was a three to one CBD to THC. So it's very very different. But the the taste was out of this world, man. Yeah, we would it's, grow it's, uh, 10 to 12 foot plants and they'd be all tall and floppy, you know, and most of the weed. So they'd be like 10 to 12 feet and, the, and all the weed would be at like 8 to 12 feet, the top four feet. <laughs> Seriously, it was just like this big bamboo stalk. It was ridiculous growing that in my greenhouse. But that's that's what I did. And I had all these wires that I, I had aircraft cable that I strung horizontally every foot and I would just tie it up to that at 10 feet. I had aircraft cable every foot. So my plants would just grow up. I had a 14 foot ceiling, right? So I just lock it in big floppy buds extracted beautifully. Um, just a lower yield, but the spectrum was incredible. 
the real pineapple tsunami, you know, if you can get the F1 and do some selections, it's incredible stuff. It's just pretty damn rare to find that anywhere anymore. <clears throat> Here's someone asking about tester beans, but I think Harry's done a lot of the testing out and he's familiar with most of these genetics. I'd say we're lucky to be able to purchase them. I don't think there's going to be much testing going on for Harry's work. He stole the seeds from the Hayes brothers and made oh, some so, sweet. So here we go. I wanted to see if you saw the controversy in there. We got McAllister and someone else is fussing about the old days. What's the input? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking. Are you talking about Sam and all this bullshit? So uh, nobody's pushing yeah. that here, man. I, I, you know, all yeah, I can you, say you, is there's a lot of if if people want to know my opinion. You familiar with that name? Greg Who? McAllister? Yes. Okay. My experience in this industry is this, okay? There's a lot of people that were doing things at the same time in different places, and communication was definitely different back then. And it's not to say that a lot of people didn't do this first or that first, but I've heard a lot of conflicting stories as a first only because, you know, they, these people, you know, does everybody communicate with everybody? Does everybody know everything about, I mean, this is something that people hid for years. You know what I'm saying? So the reality is I don't think you could ever say that I'm the first or I'm the best or I'm the master because there's some amazing minds. There's some amazing genetics and stuff that are tucked away that people are too scared or don't want to talk about or aren't really a part of, you know, being online and doing all this stuff. So that's all I just want people to keep in mind, you know, when they think things or, you know, and I'm not talking about anything in specific in terms of, you know, the history of cannabis or whatever, but you really got to keep that in mind that this is, this plant was used by all walks of life all over the place. So it is a very public domain thing and it's been passed around forever. And so I don't think anybody should really take full claim to anything because it's sort of a public domain gift from mother nature. And, <laughs> and uh, it's true. I mean, and, and, and that's the yeah. truth. Like yeah. I've just heard too many, Oh, I did this first. Oh, I did that first. When I've actually seen both things kind of rise at the same time, you know, regardless of what you're talking about. And of course, there are some genuinely documented first, you know, of course, there's an exception to everything. But I just encourage people to have an open mind, you know, when they read things, I wouldn't take everything so seriously or literally. There's a lot of great information out there. There's a lot of great genetics. Um, a lot of the history you can piece together and kind of figure out some interesting things and gain some knowledge and move the industry forward. But I wouldn't worry about it too much. You know, there, I, I've seen so many stupid brawls and just, I did this first and I did that. It's like, who fucking cares, man? Yeah. Weed is public domain. Nobody invented weed that I've ever met or seen that's still alive. Okay. So call me crazy, but that's kind of how I look at this thing. I certainly, you know, I, I have some strange to credit to the many generations of ancestors and all their selection process too. If anyone gets credit in my book, it's no one in the last couple generations. Amazing things have happened to the plant in the last couple generations, but without the many generations before us selections, I mean, like, I feel like I don't ever hear credit given there ever, you know? Well, I, I think the most credit needs to be given to the seed savers of the world of all of everything, you know, because it's it's so important, not just cannabis, food even more so. And um, you know, those are the those are the real heroes, the people that are doing some really good work in stabilizing and preserving original genetics that aren't polluted. And people that are just holding on to stuff, that's what I'm saying. There's there's tens of thousands of people that we, we as the ultra-involved cannabis community, we don't know about some of these seed savers that are across the world that 
have some things that are very special that some people probably don't even know what they're sitting on. And they're just trying to protect their genetics from that region. And anybody who's protecting seeds that aren't polluted by GMOs, you know, hats off to them. And hats off to the people who have underground, you know, kept seeds in preservation because clones and all this stuff are great. But seeds are the thing that's really going to keep things stable and going. Um, and we really need people that understand how to chuck pollen properly so that they keep it going properly. But that's true, Corey, 100%. And that's the thing. I think that it's really important that we all put our ego in the closet. And this thing is way bigger than us. And so when somebody's like, this is my strain, it's like, yes, you worked really hard on it. But this was definitely, you did not invent cannabis. I guarantee that. And cannabis is amazing. And it becomes really personal. And I've, I have a lot of strains like the garlic rose that's near and dear to me, but I don't claim to have invented you know, all the strains. And that's the thing, like most of these people, the strains that go in it, it's not like they, they went to the jungle of Africa or the highest peaks of Afghanistan and got these seeds and then went back and spent generations um, crossbreeding and selecting and finding. Yeah. They're mostly taking polyhybrids and, and, and chucking pollen and, and coming up with some lucky combinations which is pretty easy you can get really good at that if you're good at selection and you're good at knowing what's compatible <clears throat> you can come up with amazing stuff but that's you know not quite the same thing and even still it's mother nature you know it's annoying you know and that's that's like hawthorne monsanto <laughs> that's what they're fighting for that's what they want to do they want to GMO everything. They want to be able to patent everything. They want to lock up everything. If there's any drift that comes from animal droppings on your weed and they can test it and find their molecules in your herb. Now you have to pay them. And, you know, it's this is a nightmare waiting to happen, just like every other major commercial crop. And we want to stay the hell away from that. So. It is important that people save the seeds that are not polluted because I think it's going to get harder and harder. So it's going to be, you know, be who of all of us to figure out ways to preserve. You can cryopreserve plant tissue and then tissue culture later on. You can also get some seeds and just keep them unpolluted somehow and just keep those seed generations going every few years so you keep it fresh. But for God's sake, people, definitely collect seeds. <laughs> collect stuff now before it's completely polluted with GMOs because it is a fear. It is a fear that that's going to happen. And certainly people are working on it. I it's think everybody's logical. read about it. I think it's a logical fear, though. You know, like it, it makes sense to me. Well, they're doing it. I yeah. mean, it's already happening. So. All right. Well, I think that we can call this a wrap. Absolutely. Another great episode. <laughs> a great episode. Thank you, everybody, for coming on in. It's always a pleasure. We'll see you next time. If you guys have any wants or needs in terms of any topics that you'd like us to discuss on this thing, just shout out to Mr. Lobster Family Farm. And we will bring it up on the very next episode. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and everyone can find Harry. And that's his uh, Insta handle on his uh, under his uh, camera there. Helpful Harry with two L's and underscore. And it was humble underscore legacy underscore seeds. And Harry right. should be on Daga pretty soon, which is cool, too, because the community here is super uh, familiar with Daga. Yeah, yeah. Super stoked on that. Hey, thanks for coming, everybody. We appreciate you. And uh, like I said, if there's anything you want to hear about or pick our brain about or something that we could research to bring up here, just hit up the lobster and we will do it.
Sounds good, Admiral. Over and out. All right, over and out.